going up in some areas, but I'm reducing the budget by that amount. Other areas that I looked at, I've really been trying to pare down contingencies in some areas. Uh, people, uh, uh, but if I look at the past couple years and I'm not seeing uh, any, I'm using it or any risk, uh, I'm pairing some things down, technology, utilities, and of course we're aware that the cost for the stadium tractor servicing is 65000 less than what was originally put in the budget. So summarizing for this year, uh, I didn't mention this earlier, but 15000 we had a couple in transfer tax more, we had a couple, two large commercial properties uh, sale last month, sell last month. And this is the reduction in expense. 1516, with some tweaking of Social Security retirement and the Medicaid access, I reported 88,000 more in revenue, 708,000 reduction uh, in expense from the 70.4 million expense that we looked at uh, at the last meeting. So, this year, we're looking at 200,000 excess of revenue over expense. This is our fund balance. Next year, this is this year, this is next year. The, with no tax increase, the deficit or the shortfall is 1.5 million. Uh, these are the components of the fund balance, commitments, net assignments, and the unassigned fund balance. So we're right at the 8% mark where that's our limit uh, of having an unassigned fund balance. <coughs> And that's with no tax increase. Again, the difference here, uh, and here's the 1.5 million uh, shortfall, how the components change from year to year. Are there any questions so far? Hmm. General fund revenue, it's increasing 1 million, no tax increase. Uh, the main driver here is retirement reimbursement. Federal source, even though I had mentioned that we're getting 80,000 more additional uh, in access, our federal title one was actually going down. So that's why it's showing a net number there. I'm not seeing that whole thing in some Excuse me, why are local sources or for revenue are going down? Well, a couple things. We use 97% collection rate for real estate. We've been coming in around 97.3, 97.5, and that could happen next year. So 97%, it's, it's 90,000 this year. I'm still using 375,000 for next year because, um, you know, the one-time uh, sales cause that increase. And, and earned income tax as well. I think what, next year is a little bit less than this year. So those things add up to, you know, making it a net decrease. But it could go the other way. Not that leaps and bounds, but it could go the other way. Expense, here's the current year, 1415, 1516, and this is the increase in expense, about 2.8 million or 4.2%. And again, as I've pointed out so many times, the increases in our employee wage and benefit lines. Summarizing the major cost drivers. Yeah. Um, do you, I, mean, I guess, are we going to be settling the Alwatton Creek business the, the, this coming year, or, or you know, the, for 50, 60 school year? Do you think, I mean, what, what is, what the is the litigation? Yeah, the litigation. What is the I, I don't know that at this point I can even provide an yeah, update no. on that. If you asked him that question, he would say, well, it's that's a likely scenario that it would be, but, you know, he would never guarantee that, so. I, I guess we are going we to report so. this. Are we going to report this? Or that was the latest. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, but, but I think it should be pointed out that has no impact on the general fund. On what? It has no impact on the general fund. Oh, does it? The general fund? No, that's... Well, where would the money go then? It would go back into the 2000, uh, 
excuse me, the Awadden Creek Capital Project Fund. Oh, it needs to be that one. And it would be used for, it could be used for either smaller capital projects, you know, towards the transportation center if that moves ahead, or uh, toward yeah. the, the debt service specifically on the issues that funded that uh, construction project. Oh, okay. So that would be to reduce our debt. Or use yeah, for yeah. or for that right. part. Well, hopefully you have options there. Major redoing on the on the Watt Creek yet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it could be any it could be other capital projects. Any other well. capital projects. The way the resolution resolutions are written when they issue the debt uh, is it, it's for that specific purpose, but it's broad enough that it could be for other capital projects. So. Contract wage increase, including the staff requests. Our health care increased 3%, 3%. Uh, this is the rental on the three more grades, getting the Chromebooks. These are other areas of increase, but other costs have gone, that we brought them down from 14, 15 the current year to uh, next year. Speech, I mentioned, private tuition, and technology equipment purchases. These are the staff additions that are uh, in the budget. Uh, we've discussed um, we've stuffed, discussed these several times. Uh, this is the transition program that they want to start at the high school in lieu of sending our students to BCIU's program. Um, and this is where we're adding the speech therapist to replace contract contracted services. So when you add those numbers, it's 525,000. But if you look at what uh, we've saved in I've reduced the contracted service by 142. Teacher retirement impact, 335,000. <coughs> Support retirement slash turnover, 48,000. So basically, with what we're saving in certain areas, <coughs> using, offsetting what has been proposed and is still in the budget. How much, I uh, mean, Medicaid is traditionally a very poor payer. So how much of those positions would be funded by Medicaid? Well, what the, when I said the cost settlement was 175,000, uh, this year we are, I'm drawing down 90,000 to pay toward uh, the assistant supervisor and some of the clerical staff that work on that. So if we have 175,000 or 80 some additional thousand, we could we have to. Uh, provide PPE with how we're going to use these funds. Legitimate uses of, of those funds are new staff, special ed staff, which the teacher would be, as well as the paraprofessionals, or very uh, an array of you know supplies. Um, but so the, the hundred and hundred and sixty thousand. What, right. What? There would be about eighty thousand available from that new money to go toward that. The PISERS, again, just to sh you know, remind everyone where we're at, we're at 25.84. These are the net increases each year. Uh, you know, we'll start leveling out in, in 1920. Right now we have committed and assigned uh, this amount to go toward that. Uh, so just to illustrate where we were in 0809 and then this levels out for many, many years. I think in 2036 is when <coughs> it may start to drop off. Well, is that half of what we pay? I mean, is that this is the full amount. Yeah, but we get half of that. And we get half back. back. Yeah, okay. So really it's uh, this 12 net uh, contribution rate. The capital uh, maintenance improvement projects that are in the general fund is at 637,000. That includes the adjustment for the track. Uh, just to remind you, these are what this is what we looked at uh, last meeting. Uh, now, with all the, the changes that I've made in revenue and expense, these really are not options. Uh, the way we design the components. Uh, commitments, assignments, etc. So this ha has us at the limit 
of 8%. You cannot adopt a budget where your unassigned fund balance is more than 8% of the expense. Again, uh, to show you the, the assignments of fund balance, we've discussed these before. Um, and this is the commitment. I'm not recommending any change in commitment for 1516, basically because we're still facing, you know, when you have capital needs, we have the PISERS challenged. Um, and these are the commitments. I, I was really interested myself in seeing where we've been over the past 15 years in terms of millage increase. Uh, this is where we had tremendous enrollment growth. This is kind of where it leveled off. This is where Act One came into play, uh, where we were had the exceptions and we were limited by our tax increase. And more recently, the tax increases have been uh, you know, at a, a lesser amount. Of course, the millage is larger. So at this point in time, based on how we have uh, the budget built, it's showing no tax increase. And to go to something which this was prepared back in May, and when all school districts were looking at what they could possibly what options in, in terms of millage increase, and remember we were looking at 0.35, 0 0.250, uh, but just to give you some background on what other school districts are doing, this is in May, and I'm sure some of them have changed. Uh, our number was zero, zero increases, and all the way down to the highest increase. And putting it in terms of Low to high, uh, for 31.25, uh, we're still at the third, depending on how they, how people, uh, what, what they do uh, this month in terms of the increase. But Ann, that's, that's using the projections from May that they had said right. this is where we're at now. This is May, this is May. Yeah. I do not have the more, re I don't know right. what they've done, but just to give you perspective of what's going on in the county. And again, um, just repeating this to show you really what the average cost you know, per mill is. Uh, property tax relief, our allocation, 1,350,360,000. We have 7,087 properties. The exclusion amount that I've estimated is 6,114 of assessed value. At this millage, the uh, reduction in uh, property tax would be 191.05. So when they have that home set act, did the state give us that money then? The state provides us with the money, two payments per year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, is it saying we have 7,000 some properties, would you say? That yes. Is, uh, and how many properties do we have all together? Like, I mean, how many state, how many properties? How many have? parcels, I, you know, over 10,000? So then it would behoove us if we could get those people that do have their homestead act to get the homestead act, right? Because they, they, would, they would be paying less taxes than the state would be kicking in. Kicking in. Yes. Well, we this amount really hasn't changed oh, since it started. So it would be, if you have more properties, it's spread out over more uh, eligible properties. So the amount, unless the state would increase, because they determine what's available in the gambling funds and this is what we've been getting. It hasn't increased at all. No, since but I mean, what I'm saying is you have to apply for that homestead. Right. And, and some people don't. That's right. Because I know my neighbor, he had moved in three years ago, and he didn't. You know, and, and I said, well, dude, don't you have, you know, don't you have the Homestead Act? He said, no. I said, well, do it. I said, that'll be less time. So then he said, me, I got the Homestead Act now. He said, I got the less tax. I said, well, see, there you go. But okay. what I'm saying is if we can somehow, you know, people, I mean, We always, do put something in the newsletter about it. Um, 
well, maybe we could add a little bit more. You know, there were X number of properties that could use the Homestead Act, and they're, and they're not. You know, approximately 2,000 maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and those 2,000 people, they're saying, oh, my taxes are going up, and yet they're paying the full boat rather than. Yeah, and I can let you know what the, the residential or who the eligible, yeah. you know, because it, it's a Homestead. Can't be a rental. And I think that would help too with them, you know, at least, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't know if the district would send them a letter ask, telling them that, you know, this is available to you. All you got to do is get your state legislature, legislature. Well, initially we did, didn't we? We had yes. to. Yes, yeah, yeah. right. yeah. Well, I guess that was years ago, though, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Because seriously, I, he didn't know about it, you know. He had just moved in, and that's the first home they bought, and I said, well, I said, well, you know, get it. I don't even have to worry about it. You know, you know. Well, you know, and I think it, it's it could come from different things about right. from the state should, you know, they, they're willing to do it. So while we'll be adding uh, resolutions to the June 16th agenda, um, which really, you know, approve the general fund budget for capita, set the millage, uh, approve the homestead exclusion amount, uh, and then you know, reapprove the uh, fund balance commitments. Are there any questions? Now, did you um, put any <coughs> money from this, any additional money in from the state? I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, there's 223,000 in revenue uh, in basic ed and uh, special education which is about 25% of what Governor Wolf, uh, his budget allocation for this district. So 223,000. So if we don't get that, then it will come out of fund balance. But if we get more, though, it would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, well, let's, go. Let's, let's put some pressure on our legislators to, uh, you know, put up some more bucks for public education. Any questions, for him? Well. Bob, uh, let me just make a couple of comments, uh, observations, and um, hopefully a plea to uh, to the taxpayers to uh, to support me at this uh, particular time. Um, Bob had given me a call earlier this year, late last year, to be chair of the finance committee, and um, I accepted it. And the reason was is that I wanted to get involved with the budget process uh, that I think was being managed incorrectly. Not illegally, um, just incorrectly. And um, I can tell you that after five months of the budget process, I had little impact to no impact uh, on changes. I know the very first meeting I sat, I know Bev was there sitting next to me and Bob was there sitting one down from Bev. And I said to Ann, what I wanted to do for the budget this year was I wanted to show uh, apples to apples comparison of what the budget was this year and what we were projecting for next year. There were too many moving pieces in our budget that confounded the issue and I think allowed the board to vote for tax increases. Well, I know Ann uh, at our last meeting made a comment, it's on record, it's on tape, where she said basically nobody does it that way. I disagree. I completely disagree. I emphatically disagree. I think we're one of the few organizations that does the budget the way that we do. And what I mean by that is, I think that we look at what we want from an expense standpoint, and then we, and we throw everything in there. We don't vote on it necessarily as a board individually. We throw it in there, and then we go to the taxpayers to make up the difference. I think what we ought to do, and I still contend, we ought to take what we get without any changes and see what we can spend. I don't think any other organization does it the way that we do it. And I know, again, this elicited the response last year when I said about the socialist of liar, 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 or lies, lies, lies. I still haven't found anybody who's been able to prove that. 
Um, we do it in a way that I don't think anyone else does it, and I don't think makes much sense. Now, in addition, the problem I have with this budget is, and, and I've explicitly said this in a couple of meetings, I wanted to talk individually about the new employees. We put them in, and we, we vote on them as if we don't talk about them. I know that there's some discussions, I know that they're out there, but they're put into the budget. See, what ends up happening is when we put those new employees in the budget, there's 500 and some thousand dollars that we increase next year's expenses. And that's a discretionary item on our part. Number two, I disagree with Ann. Again, this is, this is, there can be accounting disagreements, but I don't think all of these reserves that we account for are necessary. I realize that we want to be conservative, but I think when we take discretionary reserves and put them in as an expense, I think we do, again, the taxpayers a disservice. And then finally, I'll go to my grave. Running capital projects through the general fund Between discretionary new employees that are discretionary and capital projects, we have jacked up the expenses in our budget by between one and two million dollars. Okay. I think we needed to have an apples to apples comparison. But let's just say that you disagree with me even there. Um, I think the most interesting thing to come out of Ann's report um, is that we are now running right up against the legal limit, even with the losses that we have for uh, unassigned fund balance. Uh, and that doesn't include what David or Jim or anyone else had asked about the capital budgets or Pat uh, about the capital budgets. We're not even counting the six or eight million dollars that we have there or the one million dollars that we have in food service. So my recommendation is, and I listened to uh, our township representative or our supervisor elect, uh, our supervisor designate uh, make a presentation and say one of the hurdles that we have as a township is high taxes. Um, I can't get away from giant meetings or red nurse meetings or Wawa meetings where people just jump on me about the taxes. Today I went and got a haircut and the people ended up uh, having to, the, the person cutting the hair had to stop the discussion because they said, he's on the board, you've got to stop. Um, it doesn't stop. I think we this year need to make a statement to taxpayers that at the absolute maximum, we hold taxes steady. But I think given all the information and what I suggested about some of the new expenses in the, uh, in the proposed budget, this would be a perfect opportunity to lower taxes going into next year. Tim, there's a couple of things that you said uh, that I disagree with, and I'm looking at it from, obviously, uh, not my point of view as superintendent, not your point of view with your financial knowledge. First of all, you mentioned take what, you know, what you're going to get rather than, uh, you know, uh, take what you're, what you're going to get, the amount of revenue that you're going to get. We don't even know the amount of revenue that you're going to get. And we play this game every single year trying to guess, you know, what are the political wins going to do this year? So that's problem number one. Number two, when you talk about, you know, um, we just put in these people, discretionary people, number one, they're not always discretionary people. These are very often positions that are created to fulfill a mandate that is given to us, and it's not discretionary at all. That's another thing. And it also totally, um, you know, doesn't uh, respect at all the process that we've used internally as an administrative team. And the principals can attest to this. We sit here hour after hour after hour going over and over every one of those requests 
that each um, supervisor or principal makes, deciding can we get around this any way we possibly can, even to the point, you made a comment yourself in the past, are we really arguing about a $10,000 library aid or something like that? Yes, we really do. We argue about everything. Can we possibly do without this position? It's not like we just put them in and say, okay, they're in, so someone's got to pay for them. And I really think that the way you make your remarks really makes it appear at a public meeting as though we have absolutely no regard for, uh, you know, for uh, saving money or for, uh, you know, having an open conversation about this. We have conversations all the time about it. If the board would like to be involved, we are more than happy to involve the board in these conversations. But oftentimes, these are based on uh, instructional needs or uh, mandates to be fulfilled. Uh, you know, the Keystone exams, for example. I mean, that, you know, the uh, project-based assessments, all of those things that we have to do in order to graduate our kids demand that we have to have people in place to do it. I mean, that's just one example, but there are many others. So I understand your frustration with what seems to you to be a very different process than what you would imagine that would be the, the best fiscal way to do it. But, you know, we live within the constraints of a public school budget, and I'm a little bit confused when you say that nobody else does it this way, I don't know if you're talking about in the public school arena or you're talking about outside of public education. Because I can assure you, I have worked in four districts and I've seen little differences in the way everybody does things, but it basically boils down to the same thing. You know, we, we have control of, I wish I knew the exact percentage of our expenses we really have control over. Because so many of them are pushed down to us by uh, you know people who have no idea of how to you know how their decisions are affecting us and ultimately the taxpayer and you know we're then our feet are held to the fire when all we're trying to do is live within the law and provide the best education for our kids I think to another you know I don't know maybe we're talking about the private sector but you know, we don't have any control of the type of children that come to our district. And depending on their needs, I mean, you, you and I both see some of the special needs students that we have and the cost that, that is for the taxpayer. We, we, can't, we cannot provide that, that service to them. We must provide that service. We don't have an option. And the costs are exuberant. I mean, they're amazing as compared to the regular education student. And yet, we are we are we are bound to do that. Or otherwise, uh, we can get sued by the parents for not providing a proper placement for their child. And 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 I mean, I I think I had asked Anne to to give me a pie chart as to you know what were the costs from previous years to this year as far as special ed costs, because I know they are increasingly uh, exorbitant. And I, you know, I'm very upset by that. Yet, we have to pay the, pay the, the cost. You look at some of these ones for the summer placement, I mean, it's an outrageous amount of money for a month or a month and a half uh, you know, for, for these children, $45,000. I mean, it, that's not anywhere near what we, but our, our special ed, special, I mean our regular ed costs are here in the district. What is, what is the regular ed cost for a first student in our district here? About 10,000? 10, 10, some hundred. Yeah. And, and special ed students are like double that, aren't they? At, at least, least. At least double that. Yeah. Could be, you have to have smaller classes, you have to have an aid with some of these children. Sometimes it's one on one. It's not, it's not that we want to do that, it's that we must do that. That is the law. And these lawmakers that make the laws, they do not provide the monies, they push it down to the local level. And the state hasn't been providing the money, and the federal government, which many of those mandates come from, haven't been providing the money. And that's the problem. I, I don't think that was the point of Dr. Tabura's uh, comments. I think... Uh, well, I don't what, know what he what meant about... I project. think what he is looking for is a different way of presenting the proposed budget 
and different action by each by the board in the creation of that budget. But now I did him a disservice maybe in December by throwing him in the thing without his having gone through the process as such. And I, whomever makes up the committees for next year, uh, I would hope that given what uh, Tim has learned this year, he can take a active role in how the budget is presented. Because I, th I think what he's saying would give more more of an explanation to the public and to everybody else and, uh, and, and bring some of the things out that are not hidden but uh, when we uh, do the uh, when we hire an employee that we normally discuss the, uh, the position of what we're going to do but uh, I'm going to throw it right back at you Tim and uh, I think you know, we'll start another budget in another six months so uh, if we can go that direction, go the direction you want to go. You, you're the, uh, you got it. Let me let me just address those comments before I know there's others. Um, in terms of not knowing what our revenues are, um, we actually do a better job of knowing what our revenues are. There is some <coughs> latitude in um, in some of the numbers, but for the most part. Our understanding of what our revenues are going to be are, are pretty forecastable. So I would be more comfortable putting a point estimate on our revenues than on our expenses. That's point number one. Point number two is I'm looking at a February new staff request and I realize it's changed. I've also realized, and this is going to sound bad, but I'll say it. I think sometimes we use the word mandate uh, way over. I think that there are some educational needs that are, man that are mandated. But I'm looking here. Library aid, secretary, custodian, instructional technology specialist, substitute driver, math support, and special education secretary additional days, and substitute teacher for reading coach. I can almost guess that none of those are state mandated. And I will again ask anybody, send me the mandate, the letter that mandates any of those. That's the majority on here. In terms of who budgets the way that I'm talking about, I also talk to schools and there are schools that are, they, they, they take a lot more beating from the taxpayers about not increasing taxes. And so they actually do a top-down budget. But what I will tell you is, yeah, I think whether it's individuals or whether it's business organizations, they all do it looking at what sort of revenues they have and then what sort of expenditures they can have. Um, the taxpayers are pushing back, at least at me, to the point where I'm starting to get the message um, that uh, they just don't want to be taxed anymore. And that we need to keep the expenses um, under our revenues. So when you say we have a predictable revenue, which part <coughs> can you predict for next year? Which component of this can you predict as a revenue for next year that you would start the budget at? Well, oh, I could predict um, the local sources. Which local source? The property taxes. That's right. Anything else? I could make a guesstimate as to what our state is going to be. No, it has to be predictable. Isn't predictable a guess? No, because that's what we're doing. We're guessing what you said. But you, we know what our things are going to be. So I want to know a guess. One thing I know is how much income property tax based on what we have this year. It'll be pretty close. There'll be a few things that will change that, but it'll be pretty close. That's the only thing we do that is predictable to me. So, well, the state revenue is the most unpredictable piece of it. That's right. I agree that local revenue is very 
predict predictable. Usually federal revenue is fairly predictable be because it's such a small amount of the budget, it's not, you know, it's predictable that it's going to be next to nothing. So really it's, it's the state and the state has not yet, but may in the future, in the very near future, develop a predictable and fair way to fund public schools. I'm hopeful that they will. And then I will agree with you, but plus or minus a half million dollars or so is a big deal for us. Even in an almost 70, 000, or 70 million dollar budget, it's a big deal. That's, that's all those positions and then some. And those positions have, you know, there's, there's people in, the, in this room that can attest to the angst that we all go through and, you know, isn't there any way you could live without this position and isn't there any way you could cut 10% more from your, uh, your um, uh, supplies or, or whatever other part of your running of your school. And, um, you know, it's a long and arduous process. Believe me, our principals and our supervisors do not enjoy those meetings because they're very difficult and we really challenge them to think of ways to save money. It, it, and I know that Ann and I would, and I think we have the best uh, business manager of any district uh, that I know of. And I know that she would do anything that the board wants. I don't want to speak for you, Ann, but we've talked about this before. If the board would like to see a change in the process, that is perfectly fine with us. But tell us exactly what you want us to change and how you want us to proceed and give us more direction on that. Do you agree with me, Ann? Absolutely. And when we had a brief conversation about how you wanted it, this is what I came up with. And that's really what I took away from our conversation, comparing 14, 15, 15, and I made comments, uh, you know, indicating what was, when you compare apples to apples year to year, what is changing in each of these categories. If we wanted in more detail, we can do that. Um, and I was waiting for conversation on the staff I presented them in every presentation. And again, we keep these things in the budget because we've gone through a long process, as Ben has said. But this is what I took away. I can only work on getting something different uh, that will work for everyone. And just recently, Anne came to me and said, do you think that we should present each new position to the board and you know, do you think, is that what Dr. Tamira wants? And, and I said, you know, and, and I'll be honest, I said, you know what, Ann, at this point, it's way too late for that. This was just a few weeks ago. I said, it's too late for that. We, we, if we wanted to do that, we should have been starting that a few months ago. And, you know, it, 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 you know in the last hour, we're already trying to advertise for these positions and hire people. We've already made some plans because we haven't heard anything to the contrary. Uh, you know, I've seen a district that goes through a process where each supervisor, department supervisor, or um, or principal who wants additional things in their budget that haven't been in there in previous years would come uh, to a big budget seminar and present their requests and justification for their requests. As a principal, I, that day always made me very nervous, but I felt like I was well able, at least I had my, my chance to articulate to the school board and to the superintendent, you know, uh, the importance of that request that I was putting forward. And I pretty much knew on that night whether that <coughs> request was going to move forward or they might say to me, you know what, it's, that's a really important thing, and I get it, but we're going to have to defer it another year. You know, and then you just say, thank you for listening to me. And you try to go back the next year. That's a process that I was familiar with in another district that's slightly different from how we do it here. And it seems to work for them. And we could do something similar to that in the future. But, you know, we, we have to get some feedback earlier in the process rather than later in the process because we're just trying to do what the board wants us to do and um, if we're not doing it the way the board wants then the board has to articulate that. And 
And I'm just going to simply say also that uh, my approach is the most non-micromanager approach. I don't want to necessarily sit and try to make a decision as to whether the custodian's second shift relief is more important than the library aide or the secretary. My approach has, here's what our revenues are within a band, okay? And that band is less than $500,000, I can tell you. Here's what our revenues are, here's what our apples to apples expenses are, and then this is what I have left. I throw it over to the people who are in the trenches, which is Bev and her people, to make the decisions as to who they want to hire, how they want to spend those funds. That's the way that it's done. So what is an apple to apple comparison in that statement? An apple, to apple, an apple to apple comparison yeah. is that when you have 19 or 2015 expenses, you don't add in new people, new technology services, new anything, new capital projects, and then compare the next year's forecast to something completely different the year prior. So you would take every, you would take all the positions and all the expenses from one year and say that's what you're getting the next year so you have to either deal with that or what? At that the same as the last year. That's where you start. Well why would why would you start there if you're saying that that's the restriction that this is what I, we have and we're going to have the same next year so this is all you have. You can add to it. You can't change it unless somebody leaves or you know the roof caves in, so you have to build the roof. But there, if you, uh, that's the point I just don't understand. Apples to apples means that you're comparing the same situation, the same people, the same resources in one year to the next. And if there are going to be changes, they're going to be separate line items that you're going to have. So if I'm going to. If one person is going to retire and another person is going to take their position, the, the person taking their position is now a line item that you have to discuss? No. person fills the position that exists from the prior year. Carol, when okay. you... Okay, right. I, I, I'm not going to waste your no, time. No, no, I'm not going to waste your time. But when, when you get an employment, and when you get the, the, uh, the uh, enrollment figures from Exeter, and you see what 1999's enrollment was and what 2000's enrollment was in 2015, right. what do you assume about that enrollment, those enrollment numbers? That they're accurate. That they're the same schools, right? Would you be happy if you got Wilson's, Governor Mifflin's, and then Exeter's? How would you compare what the enrollment was? How do you compare whether enrollment's gone up or down? You look at a comparison from the prior year or from the prior years. <coughs> That's the way I do it. Um, so how many years are you going to go? Okay. One year. Well, we're, at, we're looking level this year and perhaps by rolling in your input into the process we can have reduction next year. So no one's fighting your, your suggestion. Oh, and I, and Bob, you, you, I mean, I'm not going to get into this now because this, this is, goes back too far for me. But you were there. You sat right there when I said what I said. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know. I thought it was going to be a different approach. Um, I said it the first meeting that we had. Um, so. So then, when would you start this process then next year? Would you start it in September? It seems like it's going to take time. Let's start as Ann starts putting the budget together. And, and then you identify 
line 1A, which is $5,000 this year, and we look at it and where is the $5,000 going to go? Is it enough or is it too much? And then any additions would have to be justified by identifying the funds, either increased revenue that we anticipate or the reduction of that $5,000 for line 1A to 4500 then we've got $500 we can dedicate somewhere else or to reduction of taxes. I think they have $2,200 line items. <coughs> well, that's a lot. Uh, I'll bet you Ann has been through those $2,200 uh, two or three times. Are you willing to go through those $2,200 line items to reduce the taxpayers' taxes by uh, I think that's micromanaging. That you would not? No, I would not. I think that's micromanaging, and that's not what I'm good at. And I'm going to say that I'll go through those 2200 to reduce taxes for the people to pay the bills. So you're going to start in, when are you going to start this? I like to follow this, so when would you start this process? I would start it right now. Jim, good sir. Just briefly, I mean, well, I'm looking at the budget this year and we're able to have no increase. That's, I'm excited about that. I don't know if we can possibly go and look at tax reduction right now due to the fact that certain things increase from out of control. And, you know, one of the things we've been looking at over the past couple of years was, you know, we have our special ed costs that have gone up. We have our PFRS costs that have gone up. Fortunately, this year our health care was reduced to only a 3% increase. But I think that well, we do have some money that is in our bank account, you don't, you don't look at it and say, okay, let's start cutting taxes at this point, because I think that we're going to need some of those funds we have available. Even if we're able to keep ourselves at a zero this year and maybe possibly next year, if we're following, I think that's good. But the thing we have to look at is we have to make sure we have the reserves available when we have those building increases that are literally beyond our control. Um, when I look at the budget every year, I look at it and say 90, 95% of the money is already spent before we even set them up. You know, just because we know we're going to have to pay for our teachers, we're going to have to pay for our benefits, we're going to have to pay to turn on the lights. And it's only those extra things that we decide. Um, do I think that the idea of going from a bottom up ID budget is good? I personally think that would be an excellent way to be able to evaluate to see if we're being as efficient as possible. I don't think it's something you can start in January. I think it's almost something to start July 1st. Because it's going to take a lot to be able to build up all that background and understand it to see what's going on. At the same time, as you mentioned, Tim, I don't think we want to micromanage. And, you know, if we, I always look at my management team, Dr. Martin, Dr. Davies, et cetera, to be able to come to me and say, we need four people because. I'm not going to question because I've already put them in that professional position to be able to understand what the needs are of our children and to make things efficient. So that's all. All right. I am Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, over the 14 years of my membership of the board, I've spent a great deal of time being active in the state organization, the Pennsylvania School Boards Association. And in the course of that, I've also taken a number of courses in best practice as far as finances are concerned. I had 22 years in the private sector, 11 of those years in management where I was responsible for building about an $11 million budget. What I, what I object to to what takes place at these meetings sometimes, whether or not you intend it that way, you seem to imply that these are not best practices. And I would just tell you that everything I see in schools and everything I see coming out of the school boards association as training for its members says that in fact these are the best practices. My, my real concern, and I've been quiet on it, but my real concern is to think that we would walk the way that we would, we would hold the line on taxes and spend down our fund balance. Every expert will tell you Every expert in school finance will tell you that that is a mistake and a hole that you will not dig yourself out of. We need to continue responsibly. We need to continue to build program and to ensure the fact that we have quality educational programs here 
we're not going to, you know what, and we're not going to do it. We're just not going to do it with a ghost staff or expecting people to do more than what they can do. And I, I, th I think it's a mistake for this board to continue those discussions about our fund balance and about the kinds of things that we're talking about, cutting and being concerned about here. We need to make sure, we need to keep our eye on the ball, and the ball is what's best for the kids and what's best for the program. And I don't want to see us turn away from that. I think that we are able to do what we're doing because we've been fiscally responsible. If you look around Berks County, I think the Exeter School District is probably in as good of financial condition as any one of the other school districts in this county. And it's because of the business managers and the history of the business managers and the history of us using best practice. We need to continue to do that. And I'm not saying, I don't think anyone is suggesting we don't rest. I, but I, I think, like, I I think like, holding the line on, tax, or on taxes by spending down fund balance is a bad practice. And we haven't suggested that. But yeah, all, we're, we all we're talking about now is identifying do we need X number of dollars in that fund balance? Do we need that? Do we need $5,000 in line 1A? Or 11A, and I don't see any problem with that. I've gone through budgets, 2,200, 3,000. You know, it's it's not too much for the taxpayer to expect us to review it. We've used a different method of coming to a budget. For it varies from year to year, and it's been consistent for the last few years. But we've changed it before, and if we if the business committee can come up with a way that makes it clear and more understandable, I don't see any problem with that. It's just working with the end to make a budget. And no one individual is going to change anything. That's why there's nine of us. You know, uh, Tim and I, Tim may want to spend all of that 8% balance. And I'm not saying he does, because I don't believe he does. But, you know, he's a spend for a fact that. You know, that he can't spend any of it. I can't spend any of it. You can't spend any of it. It takes nine of us, or at least five out of the nine, to do anything. So if we want to come, if, if Tim, is with his expertise, wants to work with Ann and come up with a different way of presenting the budget that makes it clear to us, I don't see a problem with that. For us to maintain status quo, no. It will cost no. more, yeah, for us to maintain status quo, it will cost more next year. I'm sure. Think about the possibility of a reduction of revenue and maintaining status quo. It we doesn't want, go together. We have, nobody wants to maintain status quo. Well, he wants to roll back taxes. So, that's not a direct line. If we, if we use the money, if we identify the money to do the changes we want to do, then, uh, then that's it's done. It, it, there's nothing wrong with looking closer at what's going on. Is there? I just think what we're talking about is an impossible. There's only one way you're going to hold it on and expect to and that's to spend that fund. And I've seen school districts do it, and they're damn sorry. Did, they Reading did it for years. That's why Reading's in this situation now. Thank you. Yeah. And Exeter has not. And there's always nine people that make the decision. Not one, or well, there's five. Five that make the decision. I think it's a productive re uh, recommendation, and I would uh, ask you to uh, go into it. Uh, make the changes so that it meets your criteria. And if it's not understandable to the rest of it, then we'll change it too. I think we, as of right now, we have sent no no raise in taxes. If we can work toward a reduction and still meet our criteria for education, then that would be delightful too. But we won't do it for this budget. So. Is there any further comments? I, I just want to 
I just want to ask, and um, this is the first time in how many years that we will not be raising taxes. The Highland of back the uh, 15 years. So we've been raising taxes every, in the past 15 years, every, every year. If you look at where our growth, yes. Okay. Right. If you look at where our growth has come, it's come in the last 15 years. Um, but I, I, I remember, um, I will say one thing. It is very important for us to have a quality education here for the students. Uh, and and I, I don't know who talks to you, Mr. Uh, Tamara. It might be senior citizens. And I understand their plight. I happen to be one myself. However, uh, I think if we talk to people that send their children here to the extra school district, I think they they are very, very happy with the district because they see that their children are getting a, a, a very good education. And um, if, if you look at uh, the end of the year results, you know, for, uh, for our students, they have done well in many, many areas. And that does cost money to hire um, professionals that can work so well with the children that are trusted in them. So uh, I, I think uh, when you have a good school district, young people will come to it because they want their children to get a good education, a, a very good education in this competitive world of ours. Knowing that it costs money does not relieve us of responsibility to ensure that we do not spend more than we have to. I That's all there is to it. I, I agree 100% with you. Yeah. If Tim can come up with a better way of doing this process that we know that we're not wasting any, then I'm all in favor. I don't want to waste any money either. We can, we can move on. no other questions, comments, and we're going to move on to uh, the next thing is the uh, adoption of minutes. The minutes are on your uh, computer system here. Uh, does anyone have any changes to it right now? So there was a change. What, what was the change that you made in the minutes? I had a that we discussed? Yeah. I know there was a change in the minutes. So I don't know if I got a new one. I said there was a correction in the minutes. The amounts uh, for the food service budget had, hadn't been updated. Uh, uh, I, 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 I'm moving. We're, we're not moving on. We're oh. just. Uh, oh, next, oh, this is that. Right. the workshop meeting. I'm sorry, the workshop Next week, yeah, we okay. will, any changes we will wrap. Uh, we also have. Uh, Three policies. I have a question on your uh, 4A policy, the uh, administrative employees. Would you define administrative employees? Uh, maybe I can. I, I can always consider administrators as the secretaries and also non to include the non certificated people. And I, when I read that policy is defining educators as uh, uh, <coughs> individual and I wonder if for the administrators that should be in there. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. Or educators, actually, why why don't we have a policy that says all district employees? See, for the that first one, it says a section administrative employees, and then it's called mm -hmm. educator misconduct. And I, my question was, this extends beyond just the well, educators, which we have defined as a person who holds a script. These policies, uh, Dr. Weber is in here this evening. She had a, another commitment, but uh, these policies specifically address uh, changes in the law regarding educators, and educators do hold certifications as educators. 
So I'm assuming that's why it's it's so limited. Because My of question the law. is why you know why would it not yeah. apply to uh, any, any secretary yeah. or anything like that? Yeah. And when we consider all school all school employees. Yeah. That's my question. Yeah. Would we be required by law to report misconduct of all school employees of the Pennsylvania Department of Education? Yes. That's yes. something we are. Part yes. Of. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> That's what I noticed too. It doesn't include non certificated staff. It doesn't even include, say, uh, like teacher aides. Yes, teachers. Or, yeah. Yes. Yeah. or coaches. <clears throat> or assistant coaches. Okay, I'll, I'll find different. out. Um, yeah. Mr. Molsey has already yeah. looked over, and basically these are almost verbatim from the PSBA's <coughs> recommended policies in relation to these new codes. So, but uh, but I ask a question. Do you know how we have policies for teachers and mentors? Yes, we have the same similar policy <laughs> for another class of employees and then another to cover. So maybe there's well, we have two of them right here. One is for professional employees, yeah. one is for administrators. And the 500 mm -hmm. series would be for, for uh, support staff and support so forth. Non instructional employees. Yeah. So it may be that. And maybe that's, and maybe that's what's coming. That's what's coming. Yeah, yeah. That's a good question. Okay. Another point I'd ask these, both these policies on misconduct protect the district and anyone who's reporting from civil liability. But it doesn't say anything about retaliation by the school district. So it seems to me I would like to have something that the employees feel comfortable with doing the reporting mm -hmm. without feeling or, or being threatened that uh, they could lose their jobs or another way be retaliated against. Well, I certainly have no problem putting that in because I think you know that's a given. And, you know, and that's that's the way we do business. We certainly never hide anything. But um, no, and, and I, for and the I'm issue. not putting that in from administrator point of view because I, I no, I, I understand. But you. even some of but I'm own. saying communicating yeah. to the employees that that they know. Okay, I think I don't think that would change. You know, that would be against the law if we would add that in of our own board. Okay. Any further comments from policy? Now, on the suicide awareness, I, I can see the point where this is directed toward youth suicide. But, but in our district, I mean, we've had some unfortunate instances where our own employees uh, took their life. Mm -hmm. so um, just again, we could add in whatever we would choose. Yeah. The law only covers the students. Yeah. So uh, if we would choose to add uh, employees or um, <coughs> Other people associated with the Exeter Township School District, we can certainly do that. Well, let's say school community. I would think of that being anyone who's involved in Exeter Township School District. Yeah. Pretty yeah. yeah. But maybe okay. there's more language in here as to be added further down. I'll give John a call, and I don't think there should be any problem with adding those. That's why this is the first reading to get yeah. some input. Right. Yeah. Okay, next week it's going to be recommended under um, 5A that the Board of School Directors approves budget transfers for the month of May 2015 in the amount of $1,697,344. <laughs> under B, it's going to be recommended that the Board of School Directors approves the art supply bid uh, to, or awards the art uh, supply bid to the lowest responsible bidder. Award is made by individual item. Uh, art supply bid will be provided for the voting meeting on June 16th. Under 5C, it's going to be recommended that the Board of School Directors awards the athletic supply and equipment bid to the lowest responsible bidders. Award is again made on an individual item basis. Athletic supply and equipment bid list will be provided for the voting meeting on June 16th. Uh, under 5D, it's going to be recommended that the Board of School Directors approves a property tax refund to Carl Snyder of 205 Board Road in Reading in the amount of $195.30 for the 2014 
school real estate taxes paid. Uh, the fund represents homestead, farmstead, property with tax deduction that the property was eligible to receive, but due to an error made by the county assessment office, uh, did not reflect the reduction. Under E, uh, it is going to be recommended that the uh, board approves the following insurance coverages for the July 1st to June 30th, 216 period. Uh, I won't read all those, but uh, property liability, auto, <coughs> umbrella, school leader errors and emissions, and workers' comp. And it says, in total, the cost for the lines of insurance coverage listed above is $366,439 or uh, $28,529 less than in the current year. Um, the business auto coverage, is that for buses or is that just for other districts? All of them. And just out of curiosity, for workman's comp, do we know what we paid out so far this year in workman's comp claims? Uh, about under, for, under the deductibles, we have a $5,000 deductible, so we will. I can get you that information if you want the total. Yeah. If there was a lot of, uh, I guess maybe quantifier there a lot of work in this comp claims that you get in the initial. There's a lot of things that. that are reported, but maybe there's yeah. no uh, ones that actually come uh, with medical costs. Or, yeah. I can get you. Uh, I'm just curious if it was a, saw a lot of them or a little of them. Yeah, I, I thought I remember Betty at one point saying that there was an improvement in our experience. Right, the experience modifier went yeah. from 1.5 down to 1.1. So which, we, which would indicate we dropped us, yeah. some bad years and had some good years. Yeah. It's, okay. not, it's not the number of them so much as if you have a couple of really expensive yeah. ones. That's what we've had in the past that have really hurt us. Well, in I guess it was about three years ago we, we hired the assistant for Ken that put a lot of the OSHA prevention type um, information with the experience. Correct. Do you feel that you that has benefited us? That has sure. benefited us, yes, definitely. It's been very, very helpful. That input. And he is on the, on the safety committee, which Dr. Weber runs, and we get input from a variety of staff members about safety issues, hazards problems that uh, we're seeing in various schools and on the grounds and so forth. And it's very helpful. We've made a lot of changes over the past few years that have helped us and we've been very aggressive in documentation of incidents and so forth. Even if the person says, oh, I'm fine, I'm fine, you know, I don't want to fill out a form. And we've, been, uh, we've been reporting those and, and that actually helps us. in return to work. Also. Yeah, and yeah, that's one of the Yeah, it kind of discourages people from, you know, sort of prolonging something when, when they know they have to come back to work even if their duties are going to be lighter and, and different. So that's that's been very helpful. And I just have a question about the budget transfers. It seems like quite a large amount, $1,697,344. Can you tell me why we budgeted one place at one time and now we have to transfer to someplace else? That, I mean, it's a big amount of budget. One of them is a housekeeping. We moving um, payments for the note and it's a housekeeping going from an object 911 to 912, 831 versus 832. It's just an accounting thing. When you pay a bond principal, bond interest, it goes into one object. But if it's a note, it goes into another object. So that's part of it. But the other part of the significant amount of transfers is uh, if we're going to transfer $800,000 this year of that interest savings to capital reserve we would have to move money from accounts to in, to that transfer account. There's a specific account. 
account that's used to transfer funds. Under 5F, it is going to be recommended that the Board of School Directors approves food service lunch price rate increases for the 2015-16 year per an attached schedule. I'd like to comment on that. Um, I understand uh, just in increasing the uh, prices by a nickel for the uh, students, and we want to maximize participation, but I think when it comes down to the adult meals, uh, those prices are higher, so it's a, not a, I'd rather increase the adult meals by a dime, by 10 cents. They, get, they cost more, so percentage-wise, uh, 5 cents isn't a very significant percentage. Okay. I mean, if, if the board agrees, uh, Well, I think maybe with regards to prices for adults, for simple change, maybe if it's possible just to put around numbers instead of 390 or 380, just make it four dollars. 350 is a nice round number. You know, I mean, it's less change. It just makes sense to be logical. Quarters are better than pennies and nickels and dimes. You know, and we're already a loss, so. You know, I probably would have rounded everything up to a solid quarter number. That's just my way of looking at it. Do the students have, are these student meals or these? We're looking at the whole lot. I understand that one. But students could go to the even dollar for two ninety five or three dollars. The kids probably gave only three dollars in hand at that point. And the nickel probably got lost in one way home. And most, most of it's by the card. Yeah. Very little cash. So this, these are for staff. Then these are for staff. They still carry cash around for the extra stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, the good stuff. <laughs> 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 yeah, meals. Are these for staff? <laughs> yes, that's for staff. So is there any objection to raising the uh, adults a dime? How many how, how many adult meals do we think we serve? Lot. Yeah, I was just going to say, I don't think this is Adult a sales are around 20000 per year. Oh, okay, never mind. Fair enough. <laughs> I know. I, it's a big year. If they were careful on me, it would, they could raise it all they want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, under 5G, it's going to be recommended that the Board of School Directors approves the proposed final budget for the Food Service Department for the 2015 16 school year with revenue of one million seven hundred and twenty-four thousand nine hundred and seventy-five dollars expenditures of one million eight hundred and thirty-one thousand three hundred and ten and a net loss of one hundred and six thousand three hundred and thirty-five. Budget includes payment of eighty-one thousand to the general fund for utilities, insurance, and other district provided services. There's no change uh, since the proposed budget was adopted on May 18th, and you can also see the attached file. Now, I think the, the uh, service, the budget for food has been in the red, I think since I've been on the board. Um, it does, Mrs. Mrs. Clay, sorry, there's a Miss Clay, I don't know. Mrs. Does Clay. She, does she ever look over, or does anybody ever go over with her, maybe how she can uh, 
either cut costs or raise prices I do effectively because I don't know. Five I, I, I remember seem. explaining this last year, Pat. We are subsidizing the students. We do not want to charge the students any more for lunch. So we're taking Mrs. Clay's million dollar fund balance and we're slowly bleeding it down by subsidizing the students' lunch prices. That's why there is a loss of 116000 It is intentional so that these students are getting the money back that their parents or that they paid the previous year in profits. So it's an intentional subsidizing of the, you know, I Gloria know. knows exactly what she's doing. <laughs> Believe me. But, well, but I, you have the tight ship. Uh, yeah. Well, a very tight ship. You're not going to find anyone more frugal than Mrs. Clay. Well, I was disappointed in how she said how much food was wasted mm -hmm. by the students. Now, to me, I mean, I, I just think maybe, I don't know, maybe maybe this food doesn't taste right to the students. I, I, don't, know, I, don't, know what the, I don't know what the problem is. It's so picky. Or, you know, then why would they... Why would they just have lunch? You know what I'm saying? I think it's. I think we have to look into that because I don't know. Maybe I'll go and get a few lunches there and see how I like them. But I mean, well, there's something wrong with 40% of the food waste. And I mean, that, I mean, that was her comment, not mine. I mean, I, I have a hard time. You know, 40% is a lot to waste of food. It's consistent across the United States. I don't think so, Doctor. Oh, I do. I it do. Is. As someone who stood in for many years in a cafeteria watching kids dump the food in yeah. the trash, I totally agree with the forty percent. Like we were still using are. silverware instead of plastic silverware. They dump we, that too. we could go to the dump and retrieve a year's worth of silverware every year. If it makes you feel any better, Pat, Mrs. Clay actually did uh, when she was changing the menu. To do, I suspect. She runs test, uh, yeah. uh, our survey, test surveys, you know, and to have kids taste it and have to give their opinion and choose between things and they participated in it. So it's not that the food is um, totally not edible. It's gotten more she healthy had, over the past yeah, years. I, I, that, I, do, I, that doesn't run well with kids. And I, I think what's happened too is that's what's driven the price up. Yeah. It's gotten more healthy and it's made it less desirable. Yeah. I mean, maybe we should. You know, we can do away with any loss. All you have to do is go back to selling tasty cakes. They don't want vegetables. Well, maybe we should have some kind of a menu that you can choose from. I mean, we should try to help to reduce the 40% loss of food uh, you know, from their plate. That's 60%. That's not, that's they're not eating a healthy meal and but maybe somehow in health class or something, or she could go into the, I mean, something needs to be done. Because that is a lot of ways to do it. Okay, under uh, 5H, uh, it is recommended that the Board of School Directors approves the proposed final budget for the Capital Projects Fund, importantly, excluding the Awatton Creek Project Fund for the 2015-16 school year with revenue of $9,000, expenditures of $116,166, and a fund balance as of June 30th, 16, of $6,874,765. There is no change since the proposed budget was adopted on May 18th, 2015. And again, you can see the attached file. Okay. Under 5I, it is recommended that the Board of School Directors approves the renewal of contract with ParentLink for the period of one year to provide messaging applications to the district at a cost of $195 per unit plus an annual subscription fee of $1,000 for a total of $9,190 for fiscal year 1516. This is the same cost as in the current year. 
Under J, it's going to be recommended that the Board of School Directors approves the Johnson Control Annual Service Agreement for the period 7 uh, 1 15 through June 30th of 16 in the amount of $48,120. The contract amount is 3% higher than the current year premium of $46,719. Finally, under uh, 5K, it is recommended that the Board of Directors award the Lorraine Elementary Paving Project to the lowest responsible bid. It will be open on June 11th, 2015. Thank you, sir. Back to vendor first number. Uh-uh. I number six. Ask, would, would, will they, uh, Anne, do you know if they'll have the project done before school starts and for the main students? Yes. Okay. Number six, personnel, uh, Part A, we have a retirement. Uh, support staff, Christopher R. Lee. Part B, uh, resignations of support staff. Part C, we have appointments of certificated staff substitute teachers, support staff, and extracurricular staff. Part D, we have leaders of absence, as noted for certificated staff and support staff. Part E, we have a change of status of certificated staff and support staff. Uh, part S, F, is approval of uh, summer school personnel. Part G is special education extended school year program. Uh, of the personnel to support that. Part H are extended contracts, as noted in the attachment. And Part I are staff conferences, one through thirteen. Any questions or comments? I just have a question. Um, in 10, for I guess support staff, uh, Cindy Fox, and she's going to uh, PSA Dancewood Leadership Conference. Mm -hmm. Why did she need a board approval for that? We put them all on the agenda. We always have. I mean, would she need board approval for that? Just that she's going to be away from her. Duties. It's not her normal duties and uh, yeah. potentially be covered by medical insurance, so she would need specific authority to do so. But you're right, there's no cost to the district. There's no cost to the district. Right. And it's during her time off. That's not true. She works all year? Mm. Oh, does she? Oh, I didn't realize that. She's secretary in the junior high school. Oh. Oh, I didn't know. I didn't know who she was. Sorry. Student functions, Mrs. Kirchner. Yeah. 7A is really nice, and the graduation is great. I'm sure you can talk about it. Yeah. Uh, item B, um, it's uh, right, approving the
that yeah, is I, in fact, these are extended school year, yeah, for, for our special needs students who are placed in those placements, and if, uh, if the students qualify for extended school year services over the summer, that bill comes to us, and we have no choice about it. Pardon me? Do we bus them there? We have to provide transportation, yes. Those are mandated. Yeah, What's that? And those are mandated. Yeah, no, I know. I just, it's amazing. Yeah. Now, we run a big ESY program within the district for kids that we serve in the district. So, um, and that we also provide transportation to and from. And, yeah, Valley Forge and Devereux, they, they are two of the two private schools which we have 40, 10 students. The ESY is not reimbursed through that program, right. the 64 is split. We have to pay all of that. Now, the, the C agreement, um, it says uh, June 23rd through August 5th. Now, is it, and then it's, and it's 365 days per so is, is it five days a week that they attend or seven days a week? Or how, it, how, how does that work? It's five, it's not, it's not seven. And then we bust them down, or how does that go? Do they come back and forth, or they stay down? No, they go back and forth. They go back, so who do you get the bus and you do the bus? Yeah, if we can. If we can, yeah. And it's 365 days, $365 per day? Per sometimes, sometimes it's cheaper to pay the parent to do it, and that's an option. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's cheaper to put it in a tax cab. Yep. It's a matter of looking at where the student has to be transported to, but we have to provide the transportation. Well, we have to provide the transportation. Where, where is this expired? Which one? Hogan. Hogan. Yeah, Hogan's the one at Fleetwood, I think. Oh, in Fleetwood? Yeah. yeah. They're for severely autistic students. This is a fairly uh, high price. Uh, I'm going to The other function that uh, they serve very well is as a liaison to various uh, organizations yeah. to find services for kids. Yeah, wrap they, they have a yeah. lot of great contacts. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing how diverse they are, actually. It also gives us a sense of what's going on with their school population. And yeah. At least it did when they were here before I got that out of it. Say. I was surprised at just some of the things that were happening. And I, I do recall um, what you had said that um, when she had come to um, speak with us, to speak with the board several years ago, I'm not sure exactly how many years ago it was, but it was while I was here, and uh, I'm sure she'd be willing to do that again. So we can arrange that. Uh, we'll be uh, approving an executive agreement 
um, admission of disciplinary violence is stated for the that specific student. And that's it. Man, any questions of uh, Yeah, I just wanted to ask about the Karen Foundation. Is this was this their schedule last year also? Had they also gone down into the Rifkin School? Or is there, are they now going down into the Rifkin About three or four years ago there was a grant that Karen got from uh Cartet, which totally paid the four hours uh, that a person would get right and that grant dried up in the last two years we've been paying for the four hours so um, is this the third or fourth year that you've had someone for four hours i want to say it's the third third and they, they do drug and alcohol groups children of promise there's, there's all kinds of things but it's it's just it's fantastic for our students uh, and we've had a lot of compliments from parents really helped our children. Do they do it uh, on an individual basis or do they do it like the groups some, of some, 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 groups. Groups. Oh. some are individual. Some are individual, but there are many groups. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know how long they were down there in the clinics, right? Thank you, Mr. Kitchen. Mr. Stacy, your opinion. It, it will be recommended that the Board of School Directors will approve the purchase of, a, of the following textbook for the 2015-2016 school year, the Foundation of Economics, uh, an advanced placement book with a copyright of 2015, published by Pearson. That's all I know. Thank you, sir. Uh, can, I, um, can I introduce another topic or sort of in the... Would you have anything you'd like the students to say? Yes. Since I don't have a formal report this evening, um, I just wanted to talk about an opportunity that the district has that I'm hoping that the board will allow us to explore a little bit more. Um, about sometime in, in May, maybe a little bit before then, um, I spoke with the uh, director of the executive director of the BCIU about a plan to uh, the BCIU to partner with some districts to seek some funding through the Preschool Counts Grant, which has been around for a while, but we have not qualified to apply for on our own. And I know Pat's a big advocate of preschool education, and so are many of us. And um, you know, we see the kids when they get to kindergarten, and we realize that if they had gone to a good preschool, you know, they would have been better prepared and so forth. Not all of them can afford to do that. So um, we were approached about partnering with the BCIU as part of a consortium to apply for a grant through preschool counts. The IU would do all of the work in this case, uh, would uh, do the application. We would just sign on to join them in this application and uh, they would uh, administer the grant. Uh, there would be no cost to the district, uh, but they would, in the districts that partnered with them, they would put one or two classes of qualifying four-year-olds. By qualifying, uh, it would uh, mainly be economically disadvantaged students who would not have the opportunity to uh, attend pre uh, preschool without this grant and uh, we could in invite them uh, to join, you know, like I said, one or two classes. So we might have a lot more kids that qualify than who could actually participate, but um, at least it would be a start. Uh, the IU would provide a teacher and an aide for each class and any other services that might be needed. Um, we would provide the space and we've identified uh, two classrooms at Owatton Creek. Mrs. Cook is very much, uh, all of our uh, elementary principals are very much interested, as Mrs. Klein is as well as our, our reading supervisor. Um, and it, it, all we're saying is that we would like to at least explore this. Now, the money isn't really there right now. It's all dependent on state budget. And who knows if we do go forward with it, whether we would even be funded at all. 
so it's all just an exploratory thing to to say yes if you get some money and you could provide a teacher and an aide and um, you know you would use Exeter students not just from Owatin Creek but from across the district um, who are qualifying four-year-olds and give them an opportunity with a, a good curric solid curriculum and give them a good foundation before they uh, attend kindergarten that we would like to buy into that. What the district would be providing, as I said, was the space, um, custodial services, you know, heat and electric and all that stuff at, uh, at no cost, uh, no additional cost to the IU uh, because they're serving our students. And um, things like allowing the teachers to use the copier, also nursing services if the kids are sick or need medicine or whatever any of the children, um, but it would be a really great opportunity for us to not have to add anything to our budget and to be able to serve a preschool co uh, population if it would come through. Again, it's all exploratory. We're just going to give it a shot. If the board is in agreement, um, I will next week in the uh, agenda formally ask permission to join the BCIU in applying for a preschool counts grant. Yeah. You said it would only be our students in there. It would only be our students. Okay, and just another question. I assume that all the IU's expenses would be covered by the grant. All the IU's, yeah, so they, but our they expense, apply but our expenses the would not, the space and all that stuff would not entitle us to a, to a financial piece of No, that. no, okay. it would not, it would not. Uh, but it would cover the expenses for the, uh, the personnel. If the teacher is sick, they get the substitute. Okay. All of that. We have no administrative overhead or anything like that to do with it. Mrs. Cook, is there anything you wanted to add or any of the other principles? I think you've pretty much covered it. Okay. Okay. And I got a sample of uh, what would be a lease agreement. Uh, I had asked Mrs. Cook to uh, try and get a copy of one. I share that with Mrs. Guidish. Uh, they carry their own insurance. They would carry their own insurance and so forth. And, um, you know, I don't really see, a transportation would be totally provided by the parent. My only sure. concern is that, it, and that is that we may be eliminating some students who may not be able to get here, but, um, you know, it's a start anyway, and they've had other preschool counts classes that, uh, you know, the parents are required to provide the trans uh, transportation, and it's not been a problem. The parents are very grateful for the opportunity for their kids, and they're happy to drive their kids to school and pick them up. I, I think also, I think there's an opportunity that once we get in place, that some of those issues could be tweaked out at some point. Some mm -hmm. point. Yeah. I mean, never having done this, I don't know what it's going to be like, but we have some parameters that I am comfortable with. And in talking to Ann today, she didn't see a downside to it. I know that our principals, just as they've seen full day kindergarten as a great benefit over the years, would see some preschool preparation. And, you know, I'm sure your kindergarten teachers would tell you the difference between a kid that has gone through a preschool program and a kid who has not gone through preschool program and their first school experience is the first day of kindergarten and there is a vast difference especially with the high expectations that we have now for children in kindergarten and we did decide to go with full day full day yeah we have a choice of full or half day we'd like to do full day uh, and I maximize our opportunities with the students Okay. Collect some data. Does anyone have any objections to looking into educating these little urchins? No. no, I think that's a great idea. Is it going to be five days a week then? Mm -hmm. It would follow our calendar, um, and they have the same requirements that we do in terms of 180 school days and all that. So that should be. I mean, that would be great. I'm sure we'll have to have nap time. Maybe I'll come join them. Five days a week, yeah. Full day. It's torture to a four-year-old. It's a torture to a fifty-year-old. <laughs> oh, we, uh, that's why we don't have fifty-year-olds in our classrooms. We also <laughs> had a letter or a note from the president of the Exeter Township Educators Association thanking us for the. Uh, 
snacks we provided in honor of Teacher Appreciation Week. So, does anyone else have anything to bring before the board? Uh, are we going to adjourn that? I just, I just want to make a comment and congratulate uh, Mr. Kane and his team and uh, certainly Dr. Martin and your team. That uh, I, I thought, once again, just another wonderful graduation. And, uh, you know, a great venue and just very well, you know, just very well uh, organized. It just came off came really nice. The yeah. kids were great. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to thank everybody that was there. Yeah. Nothing else, we'll see you next week.